Um, I think we're just going to get um, started because we have a packed um, session after this one. Um, and so I know the organizers, organizers would like us to um, finish up on time. Um, welcome, everybody. This is our session on maternal mental health coming out of the shadows. Um, my name is Doris Chu, and on behalf of my co-organizers from Japaigo, Brianne Callum and Koki Argawal, you're somewhere in the audience, um, I'd give, like to give you a warm welcome. Um, we're really excited for all of you to be here. Um, this work has sprung from a lot of different areas. From WHO, um, we've been working on a maternal morbidity project. And what we found in that project is just how critical and important it is to listen to women, their experiences in pregnancy, and that includes mental health. And you know, there are consequences for women, their newborns, and their families when women suffer from mental health conditions. And they suffer sometimes very unneedlessly because they fear stigma, they don't think they can have access to care. Um, and I think all of us feel very strongly that we can see a paradigm shift in this space. There's a lot of energy, let's grab onto it, and get things going, um, because everyone deserves good mental health. Um, you know, pregnancy is an extraordinary opportunity for a lot of things, and one of them is good care for mental health conditions. Um, I am going to warn you, there is a little bit of strong language in this um, session. Um, if you don't feel an emotional pull, I don't know why we're here. Um, we are really, really thrilled to have everybody here. Um, I will be introducing our panelists in a second, but before doing that, I did just want to let you know that we are actually um, really pleased to find out from the organizers of Women Deliver that this session um, will be taped. Um, so all of you in the room, um, if you make an intervention, you will be filmed as well. And um, we believe that this will be shared later on, and it's just really to share how important this area of work is and to really bring it to the attention of everybody. So. Um, our speakers today, you have seen, um, we have Angelina Spicer with us, we have Manasi Kumar, um, we have Saman Hanakman and Barna Oguti, um, and I'll introduce them as they come up um, for their presentations. But without further ado, um, because I know that we want to actually have a lot of time for discussion, um, and that's what our hope is, to really make this a dialogue. So if I can actually invite Angelina to come up, please. You'll have seen from her bio that Angelina is a uh, comedian, but I'll let her tell you herself um, about her experiences because Angelina is really brave um, and is willing to share her experience with us. Um, and it means so much to hear this from you here in person. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Doris mentioned, I am Angelina Spicer. And like most moms, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I am a comedian first, a social media influencer. I'm a cum laude graduate of Howard University. I'm a wife, a mother, a postpartum depression survivor, and now an accidental activist. So let's talk about motherhood, right? The myth and the real. You know, we saw recent pictures of the new royal family, and congratulations to them, Meghan Markle showing off her postpartum baby bump. But why? Why is she wearing all white and in high heels two days after delivering? Like, where are the adult diapers? Where are the ice packs, the swollen ankles? Like, we all love royalty, but seeing images like this are making moms depressed. Now let's talk about the real. When you have a baby, you are forced to get to know not one, but three new people. Your baby, yourself, and your vagina. You're holding this new stranger, your inner labia has fallen apart, and you feel like your old self died. It's lonely, it's confusing, and for most of us, it's shameful. For me, when I gave birth about four years ago, at six weeks, I went in for my normal six-week checkup. My doctor checked my stitches, made sure I was healed, told me I could have sex with my husband, and said, I'll see you in a year. And I was like, is that it? Like, we went from weekly checkups to now nothing. Now my baby's here, 
She's the only one that gets cared for and not me. I felt abandoned. Nobody prepared me. I was completely blindsided. See, I thought the act of having the baby was the hardest part because that's what we're told to prepare for. You know, I had gone to birthing classes, I was active, I did yoga, did everything I was supposed to. I just hadn't expected to be in shock when I had my baby. Like, I was so scared. Nobody told me that I would be afraid. Like, I was afraid to hold her. I was afraid to be left alone with her. I was just afraid of, like, messing up. The fear of messing her up was just so debilitating. It would haunt me at night. I'd hear phantom cries, and I was so paralyzed by fear that I would sleep with holding the baby monitor, and I had it on vibrate, and I'd just stare at it, watching her every move. Even when my husband would give me time to myself, which he graciously did, I don't know why that's gracious, but he did, um, you know, I would leave the house knowing and anticipating that as soon as I walked back in the door, she just want me again. I tried to get back to work, to feel like myself, and you know, I'm a comedian, I work from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., and I was breastfeeding. I would pump backstage, in between comedy shows, in the bathroom, while driving, at the red light, just pump. And I knew that we had reached an all-time low when my husband Joe told me that he had a dream that I threw my baby at him. And my first question to him was, well, did you catch her? <laughs> my family just dismissed it as the baby blues, so I tried to pray it away. I'm black, that's what black people tell you to do. You know, pray to Jesus, he's gonna take it away. But that did not work. So my husband called my therapist, Dr. Carol Olson. And for weeks, Dr. Olson monitored me and she could see that I was just drowning in sorrow and intrusive thoughts and anxiety, so much so that she had me admitted to a psychiatric facility for treatment of postpartum depression. And I remember being in the psych ward feeling like I had been rescued. I wasn't afraid. I was so relieved. I, was, I felt lucky to be, to be given a second chance and to like recalibrate my mind and most importantly, to sleep. The mental health facility was not perfect. Okay, the staff didn't know how to treat postpartum depression. I was not with other mothers but I attended intense group therapy, I took medication, and once I ignored how to sleep through the suicide checks, mm, I slept better than my baby did at home. <laughs> I'll never forget the medical staff, one by one, they pulled me to the side and told me that they were proud of me because I, was able to seek treatment, and when they were in the depths of it, they didn't have the courage to do it. So now, I'm on a mission, and I'm determined to use all of my gifts to reach as many mothers as possible, to make sure that no other mother ends up in the psych ward, or worse, harming herself or her baby. As an influencer, I am determined to reduce social stigma and to normalize postpartum depression. I want moms, when they look at me on Instagram and on social media, to see themselves in my timeline. To see not only the joy, because now there is joy, thank God, but to also see the, the challenges, the frustrations, and the sleepless nights. On a legislative level, I'm also very committed on a state, local, and national level and uh, I was, in fact, on the team that helped push three new maternal mental health bills in California. So as of, thank you, thank you. 
So as of January 2020, every single mom who pushes out a baby or who gets a baby out of her will be screened by a physician. There was a, there was a referral uh, system in place. And we are really making huge waves. So now it's, it's a matter of the world catching up to screening mothers and educating mothers about postpartum depression. And lastly, I am committed by use of my gifts to make a documentary that chronicles my experience with my humor so that the information, again, is normalized, it's tangible, it isn't triggering. And the anticipated audience, once we finish crowdfunding and getting all of our funding together, the anticipated audience is truly anyone who had a baby, who's having a baby, or practicing to have a baby. Our, in, our film is intended for everyone. It's, enti it's intended to reach entire families, mothers, healthcare providers, and fathers. So here's a little snippet. She looked terrified and just scared. The only thing I knew of was what other people describe. This magical, blissful, instant connection. I just freaked out. I couldn't even talk. I wish it was different, but it wasn't. It was just, I was just like, Whoa. I have to do all this now? Like, I have to really be a mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, not on purpose. That shit was fucked up. <laughs> I told my grandma, I said, Grandma, you know, I'm a little sad. I'm, you know, a little off. She was like, oh, honey, that's just the baby blues. <laughs> When I heard the term postpartum depression, it just sound, it didn't sound serious. It sounded like, oh, it's just something that mothers might get for six weeks and then come out of, as opposed to a long-term um, serious problem that needs to, to be treated. For me, I thought going back to work would help because I'd have more balance in my life and I'd go back to what I love doing. And, but I just ended up working myself into a frenzy. She was getting more and more overwhelmed, and it did seem like she was getting to a more and more of a breaking point. I feel like a lot of us as new mothers feel the need to return to our old selves. A part of you feels like it dies when you have a baby. It's like you're trying to prove something to yourself. That's what landed me in a psychiatric hospital. I used to have dreams of stabbing Ava and her sleep. And I just feel so, God, it just, it breaks. And I would just sit there and I would see like a pool of blood in her crib. And I remember nursing her like four in the morning, one in the morning and just sitting there trying to pray it away. Like, God, just please take these thoughts away. Like, why am I having these thoughts? Jesus, please just come and take over and get these thoughts out of my head and remove these images. Because I'm black, and that's what the black folk tell you to do. Pray. Pray it away. Angelina is courageous and giving and someone who has been willing to put herself, every part of herself aside to be the best mom she can be and willing to put herself in a vulnerable position in front of the world about the hardest part of her life, honestly, in order to help other people and in a way that's true to her, who she is, who is a funny, um, outgoing, happy, intrinsically happy person.
Thanks so much, Angelina. Um, I'd like to ask our next speaker, Manasi Kumar, just how common is this? Um, are there women that we need to spe pay special attention to? Um, and really, what happens when we don't support women who need their help, who need our help? Manasi. So after that very moving uh, presentation uh, by Angelina, um, I'm going to take you through some numbers that are um, very, um, you know, they are a reminder of the work that needs to be done. And I'm making a case for integrated and collaborative care to improve adolescent peripartum and mental health outcomes in lower and middle income countries. Um, I have two broad areas that I'm, I'd like to cover. Uh, focusing on adolescent mental health burden, um, you know, connecting it to peripartum challenges, and uh, pointing to, uh, just, just sort of point us to an intervention framework which my fellow panelists will uh, develop further. So we know that, um, you know, um, WHO amongst other agencies and uh, tremendous research has been done around social determinants of uh, health and there's been a lot of focus on maternal mental health. And we know that these determinants start from these very basic context sensitive problems, you know, whether it is food insecurity, whether it is um, a young uh, adolescent of 13 years old, whether it is, um, you know, uh, gender uh, imbalance in kind of households. Um, it kind of moves away to these broader distal factors and, and these kind of broad mapping to SDGs and to kind of uh, broad fields that then, um, you know, that we use to kind of develop further understanding of how these determinants impact. Um, and the key argument uh, that I think we have to focus on is that, that we have to start by looking at these very contextual factors located, um, you know, on ground in these varied settings, but also then look at the bigger picture and then come back down uh, to understand these issues further. So it has to be a, bot a both, um, you know, a bottom-up, but also a top-down approach. Both have to happen together. Now, in, in uh, lower and middle-income countries, we know that one in four women uh, experience antipartum depression. And this is uh, rarely uh, diagnosed, uh, you know, as, as Angelina's um, kind of presentation highlights that perhaps a preparation for the birth experience, uh, but also screening, a timely screening, perhaps even thinking about prevention is lacking. Therefore, we have a greater burden when it comes to postpartum depression. So almost one in five women, uh, and this, these numbers will vary depending on the uh, geopolitical setting, the, the kind of populations we are looking at. Um, now, some um, facts uh, and, and figures about uh, prevalence and, rent and associated risk factors. Uh, an estimated prevalence of depression during perinatal period is between 11 to 18 percent worldwide, and we know that this is almost double and triple in lower and middle income countries. And the global prevalence of postpartum depression um, is between 17.7 uh, um, and, and about you know, to about 19% for LMICs. Of course, this will vary again on the parameters the studies, um, you know, have chosen. Uh, this is from meta-analysis, so um, uh, they, they are, it may vary um, uh, a little bit. Um, the postpartum depression estimates in adolescent mothers, you know, again, there's a huge uh, variance there, but, uh, are between 26 to 50%. In some of my work in Kenya, it is almost 40% um, in, in vulnerable women from informal settlements. And we know that mental disorders, particularly depression and IPV, have a close connection. And, and, and we have to understand and we have to um, kind of make appropriate uh, assessment interventions uh, for um, intimate partner violence and gender-based violence as such. And we know also that for the longer the duration of exposure to abuse, the more um, pronounced is the impact on, on depressive symptoms. And I'm just talking about depression. I, I haven't covered trauma, anxiety. All of those are comorbid conditions. And these are findings that, you you know, they apply across country settings. So whether it's high income, low, middle income, this stays true. Now, another case that one has to make for uh, a better engagement on, on maternal mental health, and, and, and I'm, you know, depression is an exemplar here, 
um, is the, the impact it has on child health. So if, if we were promoting women's health, we will have much better child health outcomes as such. So we know that uh, there are depressed mothers have um, you know, increased obstetric complications, uh, the use of analgesics, and by and large, the birth experience tends to be fairly negative. And, and you know, Angelina's um, very moving talk talks about how much we kind of um, undermine that, that huge, challenging experience. Decrease in breastfeeding and higher likelihood of diarrheal ex uh, episodes and infectious diseases had been studied a lot in India, in Pakistan, Kenya, for example, um, around maternal depression, poorer growth has also been noticed in, in, um, in depressed mothers as compared to um, you know, non-depressed ones, and particularly in third and six months postpartum uh, period. And in by and large, there is also compromised parenting, as some sort of non-responsive parenting where a greater partner, social and family support, of course, is needed. We also know from preterm mothers that they are particularly vulnerable uh, when it comes to postpartum um, depression and, and you know, a spectrum of conditions like anxiety as well. And these figures around depression range from 14 to 27 percent. And um, you know, neonatal um, intensive care units are sites where greater intervention is needed. Uh, for mothers of preterm uh, infants because, you know, depression and anxiety also around the baby's future remains. And de severe depression in mothers is also associated, um, you know, um, with, with death through suicide. So that's another area where we have very limited data, particularly around young mothers. Um, this is a figure that, um, you know, th th there's a lot that we can talk around here, but I think the point that I'd like to make is that if you notice um, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, um, you know, alcohol use and drug use disorders, the disability adjusted life years, um, you know, you'd see the maximum burden is in young, uh, in, in adolescence and young adulthood as such. And I think that's, that's the phase where greater interventions are needed. Um, and, and that's where the burden is highest. And, and this is from, uh, you know, a, a GBD data uh, that classifies mental, neurological and substance use disorders. When it comes to adolescent pregnancy and mental health, we know that over 16 million girls worldwide uh, give birth uh, between the ages uh, 15 to 19, and around a million and perhaps more uh, uh, reside in low and middle income countries. And in my own work, as well as you know, uh, some meta-analytic findings, um, it, is, it is well documented that pregnant adolescents are two to nine times more likely to develop perinatal depression. The variance comes also from the use of clinical cutoffs, the different kinds of screening tools, the age range that has been chosen, etc. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of repeating the same point, but perinatal depression, uh, both anti, antenatal to postnatal depression, that is, impacts on parenting, family functioning, parent-child relationship, offsprings, physical, social, behavioral health, and cognitive functioning, another an area that has not been uh, studied well enough. Now, this is a slide that uh, has emanated from my qualitative uh, work with, with young adolescents in Nairobi informal settlements. And what it conveys to you are these kind of multiple challenging uh, risk factors and psychosocial uh, problematics that, that, that these young adolescents have to engage and have to kind of work through. So there is, you know, pregnant adolescents um, are, are, in some ways, there, is, there are no men around. There, there are no, there's a missing partner, and, and there is obviously a great uh, lack of emotional and social support, uh, aside from stigma, which is uh, fairly critical. And if it's a minoritized population of around, uh, you know, exposed to FGM or HIV, the, the stigma and the challenges tend to be exacerbated. Another area that where we need to do better work is around adolescent pregnancy, depression, and substance use. And particularly in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, we know that depression uh, makes young people, makes people prone to consuming substances because we use it as an as a, uh, antidote to, you know, feeling low. And the, the challenges that spur uh, young people onto abusing substances um, are in the form of food insecurity, high poverty, poor family and social support, um, and exposure to trauma and, and, and kind of toxic family environment where there's a lot of abuse happening. 
And we also know that substances are very easily available in communities. They are sometimes cheaper than a healthy diet as such. So there are those factors aside from peer pressure that also um, kind of shapes and moves a person further into these kind of exposures. Um, there are these two side kind of voices, uh, vignettes from my adolescent uh, participants that I thought were noteworthy of uh, mentioning here. So one 17-year-old uh, pregnant adolescent who's, uh, who says, I have no one to look after me and girls like me have to find their own way. I will talk to the social worker and find some help to start a business or some sort of food support. So she was kind of very, um, she knew where to get support from. I can't do the same thing now. She was engaging in sex work, and if I can't manage, I will give up the baby to an adoption home. So she was trying to problem solve, thinking of what she'd do with the baby. A 15-year-old full-term uh, you know, pregnant uh, lady who was just about to uh, deliver in the facility said, I don't know whether I'm depressed the same, the way you describe it, but I regret a lot. And she was really very uh, tearful. I went to a bridge at home and wanted to throw myself because my grandfather was very, very upset with her. And an aunt told her that, you know, you, you become pregnant, it's a sin. Uh, and you don't have anybody to support you. You should have been supporting your mother, who was also in, uh, you know, who was also had her very early. Um, so, so in some ways, with this kind of a background, um, you know, I, I think that the the model this point forward has to be some sort of integrated and collaborative care, and it has to happen not only at the level of community. Uh, both in terms of uh, steering the resources and policies in the right direction, but also in the health system. Um, and during our discussion, uh, I hope we'll talk more about this, but the health system also has to become more responsive to the multiple needs and has to be uh, prepared in terms of you know, having proactive practice teams that are able to deliver mental health interventions so that we can empower um, you know, young people, their caregivers, and particularly uh, male, male caregivers and partners as such. So I want to stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Manasi. Um, so Manasi has given us uh, some views on the risks that adolescent moms face, but also gave us some hope in terms of care that can be given. But you know, I think that many times there's a myth that um, mental health care is only for a privileged few. You have to live in a certain place, look a certain way, act a certain way, and, and then you deserve to have care. And I think we'd like to shatter that myth. And I'd like to invite uh, Saman Hanukman to come up here and um, give us some, some thoughts on ways that everyone can have good mental health care. Thanks, Simone. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege to be here. And thank you to Doris and the WHO um, for inviting me to be part of this extraordinary um, panel. Um, I'd like to speak today uh, and hook out some, some strategies that we have learned in low and middle income settings of how to manage common perinatal mental disorders. Um, don't have time to cover all of them, but would like to hook out some key ones for, for discussion today. Want to particularly um, use examples because this is a burgeoning area. There's a lot of, of evidence um, emerging from a diverse set of settings where resources are very low on the ground, um, which, are, which are being published in high impact journals showing very robust evidence. Um, for effectiveness for depression and anxiety, both antenatally and postnatally. The project where I work um, in Cape Town, South Africa, we also have some examples, so I'll, I'll pick out those, those practical, practical illustrations of some of the, of the key um, theoretical concepts that I think need to be considered. There are some critical systems issues that are often overlooked in the literature, however, and I will bring these to the fore. These are the four areas that I'd like to discuss today, how we change mindsets um, to improve service uptake, how, how we need to understand policy frameworks and, and leverage those um, for, for integration of mental health care, 
how we can how we can look at the personnel issue where there are so few mental health practitioners in low in low and middle income resource settings, and how we can work um, with prevention and and social determinants. So, firstly. When we change mindsets, our ambition is to make mental health everybody's business and to, 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 to convince those from service providers to service users to the highest halls of policy making and budget allocation that there is no health without mental health. We cannot focus on the physical without the mental. We cannot... We cannot uh, it, Development cannot unfold in the way we would like without, without mental health. We need, to, we need to attack stigma in our institutions, in our health institutions, in our policy-making institutions. We need to dismantle the, the stigma that mothers themselves have, that communities have, and that the public have against mothers who experience these very common health conditions. With stigma, we need to appreciate it's not about knowledge only. It's not about a lack of information. There are prejudices, there are attitudes, and there are discriminatory behaviours that we need to address in order to increase uptake of services. We need to appreciate very um, real logistical obstacles as well that women have in, in terms of service uptake, and we need to provide the services, and we need to provide them in, a, in not only a geographically accessible way, but in a functionally accessible way. And there's some wonderful examples that I'll speak about now. So the Perinatal Mental Health Project in Cape Town, these are some of our experiences when we started out saying, hey, let's integrate mental health into routine primary maternity care settings. We went into a rural province which had demonstrated that about 45% of women had diagnosed depression um, during pregnancy. Um, one of the most senior nursing officials in the province says, no, we don't have this problem here. Um, essentially, don't waste our time, go away. Um, and there was here a conflation uh, of, of the idea of postpartum psychosis with depression. And there's very little appreciation, um, even amongst health colleagues, of, of the differences. And, and of the treatability of these illnesses. I think people, f people um, often see mental health problems as, as untreatable. Once you have them, that's it. Whereas, in fact, one of the things I say is often easier to treat depression than it is to treat TB. This was a senior obstetrician in, in one of the wealthier provinces who was so concerned about maternal mortality and poor health infrastructures um, and, and poor quality of care that he felt coming in with, with an additional thing like mental health is just going to dismantle the system and undermine um, all interventions for saving mothers. Um, he, uh, he wrote an email to a whole lot of colleagues saying this intervention is a total waste of time. But through long-term relationship building and working closely with him, it turns out that his wife had committed suicide. Um, um, it, and often, often these issues are too close for comfort. He has become one of our closest ally and he has ensured that our screening tool that we have locally developed and validated is now integrated routinely into maternity care stationery um, nationwide. So that's a that was a victory through working, through, through working with a person who was very, very um, aggressive actually initially. So we need to change the minds of mothers to take up services. We need to think very creatively about service design elements so that they're accessible. So at the PMHP, we dovetail appointments, um, antenatal appointments, prenatal appointments with mental health appointments. We offer phone counseling where mothers are unable to have access. We need to provide psychoeducation from a range of media sources. Um, we need to change the minds of the policy providers, the policy makers and the providers, and we need to provide the, care, the services with care. Um, empath there is a lot of evidence that empathic engagement can actually have significant outcomes in terms of mental health, um, in terms of depression. We cannot integrate mental health into, obstet into obstetric services or maternity service where there is obstetric violence, and we have to address this as a gender-based gender violence issue. Um, we also need to understand the mental health 
needs of care providers themselves. They're on the same continuum. Um, they, they often come from the same communities and if we don't look after our providers, we cannot make progress. These systems issues are often underlooked. We need to look at policy and find out what's there already. We need to look at existing policy under microscope and look at unlikely policy. What is the early childhood development policy? What is the social service policy? What is the health policy? What is the mental health policy? We found in South Africa, in fact, there, was, there were little bits and pieces of policy that existed and they needed to be amplified and reflected back to the policy makers saying, here is your policy, here are the policy gaps and we work together with people to write the policy. But then, once, when things are in, when things are in paper, in black and white, the journey is just beginning because policy does not translate into implementation unless there are action plans, there are guidelines, there's accountability, there's standard operating procedures, and there are budgets that are allocated. And we're working with the WHO right now to develop a very nuts and bolts operations manual so people in low and middle income countries can adapt um, and actually, and actually um, manage to, to develop a service from inception to, to maintenance and sustainability. What about personnel? Task sharing is the catchphrase. Sometimes it's considered task dumping. In, whether, in, whether, there are no, whether there are no psychiatrists, whether there are no psychologists, and in many settings where we work, there are literally less than a handful for a whole country. Where there are very few mental health nurses, we have to be creative. And people across the planet are showing that you don't necessarily need these professionals to make a significant impact. We, they need adequate training, they need adequate supervision, they need adequate care, that's often a big gap in the research. But if you look at what's happening across the planet, in Chile, a stepped care um, process, which is now rolled out nationally, used midwives to develop uh, group psychoeducation, which showed in, uh, over, eight, over eight weeks, uh, in Zimbabwe, a group problem-solving therapy, also using um, nurses, showed great um, impact. And in Pakistan and India, two very similar trials, hot off the press, have shown that with peers, with expert peers, using a behavioral activation approach, um, these uh, mothers um, got better. Um, in terms of their symptoms and in terms of their functioning and, 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 and in a sustained way. In Nigeria, also really hot of the press, like a week or so ago, um, a, a non-inferiority trial was conducted where it was shown that low-intensity interventions versus high-intensity inter interventions produced similar positive outcomes in terms of mental health um, status, which is really interesting. So only a few sessions where nurses were trained in MHGAP, a wonderful um, offering from the WHO, um, where they did uh, social activation work, psychoeducation, and, and other simple, simple manualized interventions at their own discretion um, produced um, real outcomes for mothers in, in a low-income setting. My colleague has spoken quite a bit about prevention and looking at social determinant work. We, this is a big, a big gap. We're only starting to integrate um, working with social determinants issues and integrating them into our mental health care practice. There's some lovely examples um, looking at income generating projects, um, entrepreneurial development projects integrated into depression interventions for people living with HIV or for mothers, showing that when you integrate these um, interventions, one plus one is greater than two. So we're particularly interested in looking at food insecurity and, and gender-based violence because these are syndemic issues which, in, um, which impact um, maternal functioning and maternal well-being. And if we can, if we can address the social determinants, we may well have a profound impact on mental health um, in addition to the simply dealing um, with, the, with the talking therapies. We need to look at assessing for risk and not just assessing for symptoms. This, is, this, will, this really helps rationalize referral processes so that, that high-risk groups um, can be targeted where resources are low. Different types of intervention have been shown to be effective um, in terms of prevention. This includes interpersonal therapy, peer support work, and parental preparedness. This is 
Uh, we also know that different modalities are effective. Home visiting programs, lay or professional workers can, can have impact as well as individual or group work that, that can have impact. Um, and I've spoken about how, how we need to get creative about integrating violence, income generation, skills training and food insecurity into, into mental health work. We can no longer afford to work in silos. We need to show, we also need to show the economic benefit of integrating um, these practices. There's some neglected areas that we haven't mentioned today. How do we detect are screening tools culturally adapted and tested um, tested in local settings? There's too, too often a problem of just importing tools from other settings. There are medication and talking therapies that have an increasing um, body of evidence now. How do we monitor and evaluate? How do we bring in the community in our design um, in terms of all these issues around stigma and demand for policy, the consideration of vulnerable groups and, and, and fathers? These are these are fabulous organisations. If you have an interest, I really suggest you join join them. They're wonderful, nurturing groups of practitioners, um, women with lived experience, fathers with lived experience, researchers, and um, they're um, a global force to be reckoned with. But a very lovely, caring community to become a part of. If you'd like to speak to me about any of these. Um, there's some that are targeting practitioners, others that are targeting advocacy workers, and others that are targeting trainers. Um, thank you very much. So it's possible to have care in different places and in different circumstances. Um, and I'd like to invite our last panelist, um, Brenda Nogutti, to come and speak to us about some uh, work that she's been involved in with Group ANC, and also to give us a perspective on how um, this uh, care can be given even in the most challenging of, of um, environments. So Brenda, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I will uh, begin by saying thank you to the panelists. They have really shown a wide perspective of the mental health, uh, mental health uh, issues that uh, women actually go through. So the group antenatal care model that I'm going to be presenting is a platform from which a number of uh, mental health interventions can be provided. So. Uh, what is it? What is this group care model and how does it work? Uh, so women of similar gestational ages uh, who are willing are put to, into groups and they receive their subsequent care together. And this is during the an, uh, antenatal period and also during the postpartum period. And they receive the care from the same service providers. So the group uh, sessions are usually approximately two hours long and are designed to deliver relevant information for the mother in an interactive and supportive environment and they incorporate activities that prov uh, provide behavioral nudges towards certain health behaviors that we hope that they can be able to uh, um, adapt. So this uh, environment enables uh, women to develop close relationships with their peers and also with their service providers and uh, also increasing their health literacy in different uh, pregnancy related and postpartum related uh, topics and also uh, development of their infant. And it also uh, provides improved um, uh, um, self-efficacy and empowerment towards certain health behaviors. So, um, sorry. Um, before I move on, so the meeting is um, divided into three sections. First, we have the assessment and check-in, uh, where women conduct their own self-assessment and thereafter see a provider one-on-one. -on -one. And then we also have, during this time of the self-assessment, they're also checking in on each other. What was your progress since the last meeting that we had? What has been your progress? The action plans that you developed, have you been able to achieve them? Or or not. Then we move next to the 
provider facilitated discussions that are facilitated by the service providers around gestationally specific topics during the during the uh, antenatal period and during the postpartum period uh, topics that are relevant for the woman and also the age of their infant and finally we have a time where women reflect on what they have learned and they develop action plans on what they are going to do when they go back home so uh, how did we incorporate maternal mental health in the group care setting? So uh, during the antenatal period, we raised awareness uh, in a, and facilitated learning in a safe environment where women were, uh, could be able to ask questions and also to be able to, for their, their concerns to be addressed, especially in sensitive topics that are taboo to be, to be uh, discussed. So in meeting two, we incorporated the element of gender-based maltreatment. And in the last meeting, as part of the postpartum danger signs, we incorporated the, the, the topic of postpartum depression as part of the danger signs that women should be aware of once they deliver. So during the postpartum period, each meeting, providers kept on reminding women about the signs and symptoms of postpartum depression. We had four meetings, three months apart, and the service providers would keep on reminding the women about this, letting them know that it is common, letting them know that it is, they are not alone if they're experiencing it, and also letting them know that there is help if they are experiencing this. Uh, service providers were asked to be proactive in identifying because they have journeyed with these women since they were pregnant and they delivered and they are journeying with them. They know these women. So they were asked to be proactive to identify any woman who is at risk and during the private one-on-one -on -one session delve deeper and refer because they, they were not yet equipped with the capability of actually providing interventions in the group setting. Uh, the other thing that we did is that during the self-assessment, women were also uh, encouraged to mark out if they're having depression. So this, was a, this is a sample of the self-assessment card. So women were also proactive in trying to identify. So what did we observe from the both countries they, where we did this study for group antenatal care, both in Kenya and Nigeria? And what we observed is that group care received higher uh, women in group care received higher quality care with regards to key interventions and counseling. They were also highly satisfied with their care, and there was significant gains in empowerment when we compared uh, their baseline and endline responses on statements related to empowerment. So what we believe is that due to better care, due to better experience, due to better self-efficacy, women are motivated to engage more with the health system. And that is what we want them to do, to engage more with the health system when they have any problems. And um, so during the antenatal care, you can see that the fourth NC was really high. And during the postpartum period, uh, women were more likely to receive care related to uh, mental health compared to their colleagues in the control arm. So I will now uh, just share a brief example also from a conflict setting. And we have colleagues in, the, in here who, are, who have also are working on this and can be able to elaborate more during the time of discussion. And uh, this, uh, the five meeting group, uh, group care model was, is being implemented actually in three NGO run health centers in Herat province in Afghanistan. As a brief background, so uh, one in every five pregnant women in Afghanistan have symptoms of antenatal depression. So uh, what was done was that uh, the group care model was adapted for the Afghanistan context. And in meeting two, a screening tool was developed uh, using WHO's version two of the mental 
uh, health gap action pr uh, program that uh, Simone had just mentioned. And this tool, I, have, uh, I can say, has been adapted by the Ministry of Public Health in Afghanistan, and it's one of the health packages that is being offered right now. So women who uh, were pot uh, had pot uh, potential risk uh, were referred to a psychosocial counselor who is based within the health center, and the number of referrals were tracked. The other thing that was also provided, just like the same way we had it in Kenya and uh, Nigeria, we, they also provided, during the last meeting, women were provided with appropriate information about postnatal uh, depression, that is the symptoms, uh, common psychosocial uh, triggers, and also their consequences uh, of not uh, uh, treating uh, postpartum depression, information about and resources about where they can be able to get care, and most importantly, which I didn't also mention, is that informing the family members. We need to inform the family members so that if they see these symptoms, they are also supportive to the woman and can help her seek care. So since uh, this was started in March 2019 when the cohorts have, were started, uh, to this is early uh, May 2019, so we don't have so many women, but of the 38 women who have been screened through meeting uh, two, 26 were referred to a psycho psychosocial counselor. Those are women who would have gone back home without care. So this is really important, this is huge. So we believe that, uh, that group care can raise awareness, facilitate learning in a safe environment because we want women to be able to be courageous to freely ask questions. Their concerns are addressed. They have a supportive peer network that can actually support them, not only their peers, but their service providers who they can reach out anytime by phone or in person. That is what we want. And key is referral, because right now we do not have many of our service providers who have the right tools in their tool set to actually support these women in treatment, but they can be able to make them aware and make them aware of where they can be able to get these services. So, thank you. Please, a round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you. And so now, if you, you have heard the stories and the experiences of all these remarkable women um, on the panel. We'd like to hear what you think. How do you think we can enforce, enact a paradigm change when it comes to maternal mental health? And my colleague, Kath, um, is here. She's got her microphone, and she's ready for anybody um, who'd like to make a statement, comment, ask a question. Um, we have purposely left a bit of time for um, some discussion, and we hope that you will um, discuss um, and share with us. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Michaela. Uh, I'm with One Heart Worldwide. And um, for Angelina, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story. Um, thank you. I have two kiddos, so. I will not share my story, because in many ways you've already told it. So I just wanted to say, I see you, Mama. Oh, and um, I see you too, girl. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, some of the policy uh, activities that you've been engaged with, and those are fantastic. So I just wanted to share a piece to kind of add to that a Please, little bit. Please, yes. Um, in my own journey trying to access care, in Silicon Valley, of all places. Um, when I met with my doctor to find care, um, there were, of all the therapists available in a very populated, overall well-resourced area, um, there were two in a 45-minute driving radius who specialized in maternal 
depression, postpartum depression, had any specialization there. So as we think about these resources and making sure that moms have access to care that they need, I just wanted to emphasize um, that role of specialization. I've loved hearing the stories of, you know, that the other panelists have shared um, of work that are engaging moms to have that peer support, that specialization, because that is so crucial. Two people that I could go to, and I had to depend that we would vibe enough for them to meet me where I was at. Um, and so if those were the struggles that I experienced in my very privileged little corner, um, how much so in, in other environments. So thank you very much for all thank of your you. stories. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. My name is Samantha, and I'm a psychologist here in Canada. Um, this is a question for Simone, but really anybody can answer. I'm curious about what behavioral activation looks like when it's rolled out in these communities, because I think when we deliver it in a North American setting, it looks like a very specific, take care of yourself, treat yourself, make sure you're treating yourself well. But in a community where there's a lot of other focuses, more crises going on, more active trauma day to day, how do you, how do you implement that? Um, I think. Well, firstly, the, the language, there's a suggestion that the language changes and we don't use the term behavioral activation. I think some, some people who work in the field call, call it getting, getting active. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly don't suggest that people go to yoga <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and entertain less. But um, we, clearly the focus on homework is not appropriate mm -hmm. and, and paper-based homework is not appropriate in a lot of the settings in which we work. Although some people have adapted the behavioral activation tools where there's a, a, a where one can um, uh, we, to, to be more graphic and visual as opposed to to use of, of words and that has in some settings shown uh, been been useful. I think it's really a collaborative discussion with uh, the mother to explore um, what normally gives her joy and what normally gives her happiness and to amplify those and to um, speak about how and, and to really instead of giving advice on this as well you should do more of this or do, or do less of that is to, to, to help her come to, to a way of thinking about how to, to engage um, in, in activities that increase pleasure. Um, and often they link to social activation activities. Um, so we're killing two birds with one stone. So we're discussing, we, we explore with mothers um, what, what social connections, what prior social connections were there and, ca and can, can mothers re-engage with those, whether it's peer groups, family groups, faith-based groups, um, that sort of thing. Super. I see a lot of hands up, so um, Brienne has helped. Uh, and so what we'll do is, um, because we really want to hear from everybody, is let's take a couple of questions, comments, and then um, we can start again. Brienne has already started here. Yes, thank you. Good Please introduce everyone. yourself. My name is Colleen. Um, I'm with the Ministry of Public Health of Guyana, and I would like to thank you ladies for sharing all of your stories. And I'm bad with names. I can definitely re re um Angelina. <laughs> Angelina. Yes. I can definitely relate to your story because I went through a similar pr process. And my husband, that's why the involvement of men, it's important. He was the one who said to me, you need help. I can see that you're not well, so you should get yourself help. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Um, as a resident psychiatrist in my country, it gives me honor and privilege to be here because I don't know if persons know much about Guyana, but... A doctor in Guyana many years ago used to only be males, and they used to be gray and bearded with spectacles. <laughs> and now, <laughs> when persons come to the hospital and you insist that you're a doctor, they're like, but aren't you too young? Um, you're probably the nurse, and they just can't believe that, right? So the work that I do sometimes, it's difficult for me, and I suffer a lot with institutional stigma, because my patients, they always come to me, and in the primary health care, they're told sometimes, if you know you got a mental illness, we are going to make children fall, we are going to get pregnant for, 
right? So these are the things that patients relate to me in those exact words. And I, I speak sometimes with my colleagues and they're like, yeah, but you know, psychiatrists, you guys are not real doctors, and you know, I don't know how you deal with that. So I need some help. So after we finish here, I really need to engage with you ladies, because I'm embarking on a journey where I want to advocate for the sexual and reproductive health and rights of these women, not during the period of pregnancy or before or after. I just want, you know, I want the, um, their general mental health to be taken care of, just as how we're taking care of diabetes, TB, and everything else, right? So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hi, my name's Sarah Jeffrey, and I work with uh, the Beetle Foundation, and we're an organization that works with a number of health grantees across kind of various geographies. And thank you very much to everyone on the panel. I thought it was fantastic. Um, one of the things I'd be interested to learn more about is, as a, a funder in the health space and a former implementer, there's a real challenge around health workforce and the number of people available to deliver these services, even if we have creative ways of, 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 of implementing. And I would be interested to hear more about how any of the programs you know have been working with kind of the traditional pastoral systems of support, whether it be with traditional birth attendants or bringing them in to kind of recognize as kind of referral pathways to some of these groups or traditional healers, but just kind of quite creative ways of trying to spread the message as wide as possible. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I was just hoping to get some advice from any of you um, in how to engage in a productive conversation with people who don't believe like in um, postpartum depression, um, which unfortunately I didn't um, encounter. I recently finished like a master's in human rights and I was in a gender and health class and my professor was saying that um, postpartum depression was a, a way of reinstating patriarchy into the uterus and and my history is like um, as a perinatal nurse and like now I work with women in addictions um, who are pregnant and so I'm just like I was giving her all the statistics about um, women who have postpartum depression, and like was saying this, and she was automatically going to like um, prescription of antidepressants and stuff and all full stigmas, and I was trying to use my statistics and stuff like that, and she ended up like just saying, "Stop raising your hand. I know what you're going to say already." <laughs> so I was just wondering if you have like advice like from those like naysayers and like how to have that in productive productive engagement. Thanks. Thanks. Um, We've got some more interventions. Okay, I see one, two, three, yes? Four, okay, um, let's try to get these four and then have our panelists have a, a chance to respond. Please, um, thank you. I'm Dr. Achna Mishra, working in India with government of uh, Madhya Pradesh, one of the state of India. Uh, we have in our country a mental health program which's a vertical program, it's not linked to maternal health. So as uh, our speaker from uh, WHO mentioned that the prevalence is quite high. We didn't know that. I'm also a gynecologist. Ladies are coming to us with uh, insomnia and we think that they are tired and they are not getting enough uh, sleep. And uh, uh, my request is to share uh, the tools which are available for identification and management of these mental uh, illnesses during pregnancy and postnatal period so that we can link it with the existing skill-based programs like uh, SBA training or any other trainings which are existing for our paramed paramedical staff. And also we have link workers in our uh, uh, country. Like uh, every thousand population, we have a link worker. She's called activated social health activist. And uh, uh, at the community level, like one of the colleagues mentioned that we need to propagate this message at the uh, community level also so that the women are diagnosed with this problem and they are brought at the right time to the institution and instead of having vertical programs for mental health and maternal health and communicable disease the programs of having cross-cutting issues should, should be linked to each other thank you so much thank you yeah, Lady so up. I'm uh, Sunita Singhal I, I'm from in general health India and I'm also a clinical person, absolutely, gynecologist all my life. So first of all, thank you and congratulations for bringing up such an important topic. As Dr. Archana has just mentioned, we've been observing, finding sporadic cases when they are really come up with a full-blown picture of postpartum psychosis. That's when we land up and just address them. So looking at the kind of presentation and the work you have done, I think 
what I can foresee and envision and which is my desire at the moment is that we have all those great antenatal checkup cards which have a list of the screening tests, uh, hemoglobin and urine and blood pressure and HIV etc. So why not, why not add screening for postpartum uh, assessment for kind of a depression. So let us add that also into the intentional card. We've already in India, we've been working a great deal on postpartum family planning. So we've been able to embed that into the antenatal card. Let us work something with very key critical points and train. We don't have to hire so many psychiatrists or there's no need for having, uh, a, you know, a cadre of psychiatrists or some very, very senior person. Let us start with just the basic things, key screening questions. Let us train our own midwives, ASHA workers, ANMs, and even doctors, and put it even into the service, pre-service curriculum of doctors and nurses. This is how you screen women. Right. This is how you identify during antenatal period and during postnatal period, and no woman who walks out of the institution after delivery, delivery post or discharge doesn't go out without this screening and referrals and advices. Right. So that's something thank I'm you. looking at. Thank so you. thank you for that. The mic is here. Oh. So um, thank you so much for the presentation. Very powerful and I think very timely. Um, I'm Mick Smar from the Philippines and I'm handling adolescent health and HIV program in, in my country. Um, just this year, uh, just last year, we, uh, um, the country has passed the mental health law and we're drafting the IRR and this is something that is very important. What I didn't see from the presentation and I would like maybe to know more about you is when do we actually provide mental health services for women who have just underwent abortion? Something that was not touched, but I have a personal experience when I, because I advocated these kind of services for all women, um, regardless of reasons, to have that kind of services. And in the country, in my country, abortion is illegal, still illegal. Um, another one is for those who have experienced sexual abuse. A lot of women are experiencing sexual abuse and they are forced to live with their partners. And of course they have to, in, in, in my country, traditionally people are married because of that cases and they, they experience a lot of mental health issues. Are those framework that you have mentioned earlier are the same framework that we can use? Because um, in, in the program that, that I'm handling, we don't have any idea how to integrate mental health yet. It's something that, we, that I myself is learning too. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman up here. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Saim. I'm from Bangladesh UNICEF. Uh, I like the idea about the uh, GANC. That's really great. Uh, but in a country like in Bangladesh where uh, mental health is a, it's a kind of issue, raising a rising issue, uh, and um, due to social stigma, it is very important because if the pregnant mother has been diagnosed as a mental case, it may lead to a thinking of, uh, the community may think of that uh, this is a bad spirit, that kind of thing also is very important and can lead to a risk of treatment to another areas where which is not recommended. So uh, in in our country, like um, we have a problem. Even the mothers, pregnant mothers, they are not uh, um, uh, interested to uh, and disclosure of our pregnancy in the community because uh, that's an uh, issue as well. So in that case, I was wondering whether uh, implementing this GNC um, has any risk. Uh, whether you faced any risk on that. So that would be interesting to know. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have, um, we've got a comment in the back. Oh, wow. OK. <laughs> uh, we've got a comment in the back. I see the lady here and um, a lady there. So let's take the comment from the back, please. Um, so um, I yeah, I think okay. you all are pointing to me. Um, I'm Francesca Holm from PATH. Thank you so much for the wonderful and really important presentations. I just wanted to ask what is being done or maybe what can be done to increase access to medication, which can be such an important tool uh, for combating these illnesses in low resource settings, but is also sort of complex. Um, women need to try one medication and then maybe they need to try another and they need to adjust doses and it seems like a more difficult task to share um, with non-psychiatrist -psycho providers. Okay, so we've got, um, got one more last comment in the back and then 
I know everybody's really excited. This is fantastic. Um, but what I'm going to do is let's take this last comment in the back. I know that there are some folks who could not speak. Um, and I'll invite you to come by and speak to us afterwards we leave from here. Um, so we'll have our last comment. I'll have some reactions from our panelists. Um, and then we can um, get you on your way for lunch. Please, sir. Hi, I'm Brian Willis from Global Health Promise. We work with female sex workers who become pregnant and give birth. And I'd like to just mention the need to address uh, not just postpartum depression among female sex workers, but also antenatal depression. Um, we're doing a study right now. We've already identified five uh, prenatal suicides among sex workers in Kenya alone, uh, four or five more uh, from, two that was in 2019. 2018, another four. South Africa, a number. And India, just in one city, uh, four um, suicides of pregnant women in 2018. So uh, I think that oftentimes uh, female sex workers are, you know, face a lot of discrimination and stigma. And I think that there's a l big need to look at both pre and postnatal depression among female sex workers. Thank, Thank you so very much. Um, Manasi, tell me, um, you've heard a lot of comments from the audience. What are some reactions that you have? Um, uh, first of all, I must say that all of your um, comments were very, very helpful. And uh, you know, th th there were already signs that we'll have to start thinking about a, of a more um, integrated model of mental health, that it, it's not something that has to be done by the side. It has to be offered there and then. Um, integrated within whatever service, whether it is sexual and reproductive health, whether it is HIV uh, prevention or care, uh, whether it's adolescent health or MCH um, as such. Um, and that really is a way to go. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to mention here that um, in global mental health, there is now also this idea that some of these very interesting um, novel innovations of testing group intervention strategies, whether it is IPT, inter group interpersonal psychotherapy, whether it is CBT, et cetera, um, that these are also modalities that could be tested in vulnerable populations in higher income countries. So there is some sort of knowledge and, and transfer of um, ideas that uh, you know, make huge sense in this low resource uh, context. Uh, uh, so that's one that we need to also start thinking about what can be transported from these settings and tested to marginalized pockets elsewhere. The second idea is, um, and it wasn't the remit of my work, but what I'm testing in Kenya is an integrated model that uses collaborative care, which is that we train nurses, uh, the ANC nurses, as well as social workers in co-delivering interventions. So the clinical workflow is kind of managed a little bit by the um, ANC nurse using the MH gap recommendation. Great, wonderful uh, WHO tools are available. And I'll be happy to share those with you uh, and point you to um, those open access resources. Um, and then uh, kind of creating these case managers. And that requires a little bit of uh, systematic training that we have to train um, providers, whether they are lay health workers or whether they are formal workforce within the health facility, we have to train them to be patient-centered. We have to train them to be women-friendly. We have to train them to be adolescent-friendly. And then we have to provide continuous support so that they are not burnt out and that they also have some sort of support structure to enhance their capacity. So that's, that's what I want to uh, comment on. Thanks so much, Manasi. Brenda, maybe you want to answer or give some words on the Group ANC um, work that you've been doing? Yes, so I'm going to be addressing the lady who asked the question about using other um, cadres and also addressing the Pakistan. So uh, when, uh, we, when we did the group antenatal care, we were mainly focusing on the service providers who are the nurses and the midwives in the MCH. However, after the group antenatal care, what we, we decided to do, the, the, the study itself, what we decided to do is now the, for the um, Nasarawa state and the counties that are continuing to implement is to see how we can integrate and work with community health volunteers who can identify the women 
uh, uh, and bring them early for antenatal care services. But also one thing that maybe we can also think about is how do we also empower these CHVs to identify women who are in communities who are going through these signs, who have these signs and symptoms, and link them to care. And as, as uh, Manasia said, our systems are very vertical. We need to see how we can integrate. Yes, we were, we were empowering the service providers on creating awareness, but they themselves do not have the capacity to do the treatment. Mm -hmm. So how do we ensure that we are able to also build their capacity? Because they have this bond with this woman. How can we be able to help them build that capacity? And uh, addressing your question about any risk that we had. So we uh, had uh, women coming in. We just took women who are coming in for their first NC for the study. However, as I've said, we need, we need to have CHVs who can be able to encourage women, who identify women from the community and bring them in early. However, when they start interacting, with their service provider, and they see that this care is different, that these service providers are actually respectful, they are actually caring for them, they are motivated to come back and receive more care, to learn more. They are getting information that is relevant for them and for their baby. So it is like they, they, there's a motivation to come back for more. And the other thing that we noted is that we had mixed groups, adolescents, anyone above 15 years old with older women. The one thing that they said when we asked the adolescents, would you want a separate group? The ones who mentioned that they wanted a separate group, it's not because they were intimidated by these women. It's because they were like, oh, these ones, they go much, they, they, because of the experience that they have, they, they want to finish quickly. But they felt that they were, they were really protected by the women. They, they felt that they were, they, the experiences that they shared was actually relevant for them because they were, most of them were first time mothers. So they felt protected in this network of peers. So uh, in terms of risk, we, really, we saw very minimal risk. Yeah. Thanks, Brenda. So Mon, maybe you can give a couple of words on um, how healthcare providers themselves can um, receive the, the care that they need. Um, it's, it's very hard mm -hmm. to, to go to work every day and, and to hear these stories and, and feel that maybe you, you're not being supported. So how can we change the paradigm there so that moms and women um, can have better care? I think it requires a sort of systems change and we have to kind of look at our inst look at our health delivery institutions to I in a an, uh, an upend the kind of notion that um, that if you're a provider you are immune to the same kind of health problems that that um, or social problems that your clients have. Um, I think this can be done. It, I mean, we have we've done it through very um, for, through a range of different. Uh, training processes where we bring in, where we are, we train um, very senior people as well as the people who are cleaning the floors and who are the security officers um, and everybody in between. We uh, use a participatory training process which allows people to explore their own vulnerabilities and their own mental health issues at the same time as appreciating the mental health issues of their clients and, and, and experience, we use theatre techniques um, to for, for for people to to embody um, that experience, and quite often from that um, there flows a natural process of 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 care providers thinking. Well, how can we um, as as a peer group look after our own well-being? How can we look after each other um, when people are so stressed and overwhelmed? when it's been dangerous to get to work, when there's supplies that have been run out, where people haven't been paid for six months, <laughs> people get upset uh, and aggressive. Um, so so we, we acknowledge those challenges, and I think quite often just acknowledging those challenges gives people an opportunity then to um, imagine ways of supporting each other. We've developed an intervention called Nyam Kele for Care, which includes a peer peer-based, uh, among, uh, among health provider teams, a peer-based approach for um, integrating peer-driven learning, case sharing, and self-care practices based on mindfulness techniques 
and um, it's extraordinary how, how that has um, influenced um, the whole ecology or the whole culture of some of the of the health services we've worked in. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic, Simon. Yeah. So I know that there were a lot of um, uh, comments and questions, and I um, just to say that probably that we can, can we should continue this this discussion. Um, of course, we have a WHO booth um, where um, some of us will be, and you can come and stop by and find me, and we can always have a discussion. The WHO does have a maternal morbidity tool where screening on uh, postpartum depression and anxiety um, is included, and um, we can point you in the right direction there. Um, and just the, the full breadth and depth of sexual um, and reproductive health as far as mental health um, and that intersection is something that we're looking very hard at these days. So I know that we didn't actually touch upon every single question and comment that came. But before I close, I just wanted to ask Angelina, who, um, who uh, opened us uh, the session with her very honest and, and candid um, experience, hearing all of this, and seeing the journey that we've been on yeah. together in this right. hour and a half, what's your wish for how things we can change? I talk about my wish every day on stage at comedy clubs. Um, my wish is for like a radical change. Simone kind of mentioned it earlier. Like we just need an overhaul of the way we talk, the way we treat, the whole conversation around mental health, number one, it needs an overhaul, but especially maternal mental health. We all give birth, women give birth every day, we get pregnant every day, but our mental health after we have a child and during pregnancy just is not discussed. We need, I've dubbed it the hashtag postpartum revolution. We need a revolution. We need to revolutionize the way moms communicate with each other with the way families communicate with each other about their own experiences. You know, so much of the conversation really is driven by social stigma. <laughs> like if you don't have the courage to speak up because you feel isolated, then you won't seek help. Um, so there's a lot of work to do, but we do need a hashtag postpartum revolution. Um, and honestly, once the social stigma goes out the door, like then our healthcare providers can really treat us and meet us where we are. So that's my wish. Thanks, Angelina. Um, I really wanna thank all of you. Um, and I know that all of you are sitting here and you feel passionate about this. Um, this, this topic area, and, and this has been a great panel and it's been a privilege for me to have had um, these lovely um, ladies and women to work with me. I want all of you to think when you leave here, no matter who you are, what you do on a daily basis, think about how it is that you're gonna integrate care. How are you going to work better in a team? Um, it's, it's actually a lot easier when you're part of a team than when you're trying to do it all on your own. Um, how can you support change in, a, in the health system that you're working in or, you know, or receiving care from? Be an advocate for yourself and for others. Um, if you're a provider, recognize the danger signs, talk about it. Um, and if you're an academic, and a researcher, yes, we have evidence, um, and we should be acting on that, but we certainly need more evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and so please, get out there, think about your ideas, write up your research proposals, send them to funders. Let's push this agenda, and very finally, let's stop, let's get this out of the shadows, and let's really talk about this, please. Um, so thank you again so very much for all of your engagement, your excitement, and thank you to this wonderful panel. And enjoy a great rest of the conference. Yeah.